I began my career as a, as a mathematician, and I mean, I, I have deviated into trying to build thinking machines, because it would be really awesome if we had thinking machines, but I still think about the more theoretical questions a lot. So this is a, one theory question that's nagged, that's nagged in my mind forever is like, okay, what kind of world do you need to create a mind? And given a certain world, what kind of mind will be intelligent in, 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 in that world? And ideally, what you would want, or what I would want from a theory of AGI is, if I could feed in the properties of the world, then my theory would tell us, okay, what, what properties does a mind need to have to be intelligent in that world? On the other hand, if you feed in the properties of a mind, okay, in what worlds will that mind be intelligent? And if we had a theory like that, then I'd say we have a real science of AGI. And of course, we're a very long way from that now. What we do now is just kind of co co cobble stuff together in in intuitively and, and hack things based on combining knowledge from a variety of, of different sources. Um, I mean, the, the philosophy underlying this is that human-like AGI reflects in large part an adaptation to the everyday world that humans live in. I mean, if you're not worried about adaptation to the world, then Marcus Hoder solved the AGI problem. I mean, Solomonoff essentially solved it before him in the 60s. You, you just assume an infinitely powerful, or almost infinitely powerful computer search through program space, and Hoder's algorithm AIXI is intelligent everywhere. Now, the reason that doesn't work in practice it's because there are resource constraints. Given finite resource constraints, the system is going to be biased in what environments it can really be intelligent in given a fixed amount of time. On the other hand, given a bias in seven environments it really has to deal with, that's okay. So it becomes a matter of, of mapping the inductive biases that a certain system has as a response to its computational resource constraints to the inductive biases that are useful for achieving certain goals in, in certain worlds. And that, that's what we're always doing implicitly when designing AGI systems, and having an explicit mathematical model of that would be interesting. I mean, I, I had a paper at a NASA conference once just thinking about all the ways in which our intelligence is adapted to the world of solid objects that we live in. All these ideas of, of causality, for, for example, really, and logical reasoning and language were based on defining things in little pieces and combining them. What if we grew up in the gas clouds of Jupiter, right? I mean, how, how different would our whole, our whole way of thinking be? We're really adapted in so many ways. I mean, the whole obsession with hierarchy that we see in AGI systems, that's right, given the everyday world we live in. How right would that be for a system in the gas clouds of Jupiter? We, 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 we really don't know. I mean, that's just a commonsensical example. Now, I had a bunch of uh, slides in here looking at virtual worlds and robot labs and so forth with a view toward thinking about how the virtual world and robot lab influence what the virtual agent and the robot can learn. I'm going to skip past that and just spend five minutes going through the math, the math of, of the paper since we don't have, have much time. Uh, a key hypothesis I have drilling down a little bit is that different kinds of knowledge are important to think about and to have a human-like intelligence we need a system that can deal with declarative, procedural, episodic, sensory motor, attentional, and, and goal-oriented knowledge. We therefore need an environment that's quite rich in terms of all these forms of knowledge and, and, and their interactions and that's that's one aspect of what you need from a world in order to be good for development of a, of a human-like mind. And, of course, not all tasks that people have thought of for training AI systems match this, right? But many of them are lacking significant aspects of this. That doesn't mean you couldn't use an environment that lacks one of these memory aspects to make an intelligence. But 
could you use it to make a human-like intelligence? I don't know, because human-like intelligence really emerged to deal with all these different kinds of knowledge and their interpenetration. So what I describe in the paper is a, a sort of abstract principle I model the mind and the world in terms of probabilistic state transition graphs, and I then look at the path, the paths through the state transition graph in the mind, and the path through the state transition graph in the world. Now, in category theory, the paths through a graph can be viewed as a category. So you look at the paths through the state transition graph in the mind, on the one hand, the paths through the state transition graph in the world, on the other hand, and my hypothesis is that you need to have approximately a morphism between the category of mind state paths and the category of world state paths. If you have that approximate morphism there in a category theoretic sense, then you can say that the mind is in some way reflecting the structure of the world. So my, my hypothesis is that to have real world intelligence, the network of the mind, the paths through it, have to have a nice morphism into the paths through the, through the states of the world. But make it, making that precise is basically the job, the job of the paper, which, which requires a, a bit of work. And I can go through that only, only very quickly. Here. So I, I, I set up an uncertain state transition graph associated with, with any system. So you basically cluster the states of the system and then you can get probabilistic weighted transitions between these, these state clusters of the system. So that's an un uncertain state transition graph, which you can construct for, for any system. Then, given a state transition graph, you look at paths between them. So here the P and Q are paths in a state transition graph, and the, the F maps one category into another, for example, the world into the mind. And you have the basic equation of category theory. Of the amorphism means that when you map two paths in the world into the paths in the mind, representing what the mind experiences when it perceives those states in the world, then then it, it works out nicely in terms of, of composition. So in more detail, P and Q were paths through the world state transition graph. FP and FQ were paths through the mind state transition graph. F is a function that maps something in the world into what's experienced in the mind when that world state obtains. And the star operator concatenates paths through the state transition graph, just glues one path onto the end of another. And then this is a notion of a, a, a functor that it preserves identities and obeys that equation. You can also look at an approximate functor. That's not standard category theory, but one, one, one that almost, almost preserves that operation. The definition of intelligence, I don't have time for that now, but if you look in the proceedings of AGI 10, I gave a paper called The Formal Definition of Real World General Intelligence, and gave a, a series of definitions of intelligence. I mean, in essence, this one, which is the efficient, pragmatic general intelligence, it looks at a probability distribution over worlds and goals, and basically averages how well do you achieve those goals over those worlds normalized by the amount of resources, Q, that you have to expend in, in, in order to do that. And that's what the efficient is for. If you get rid of the word efficient, you have what I call the pragmatic general intelligence, which is just, on average, how well can you achieve those goals in, in, in those worlds. Yeah. So you assume Well, in order to measure intelligence, you have to assume something. Yeah. And the, the system doesn't have to know what those goals are, or have them represented explicitly. I mean, in, in the paper, I also discuss the problem of inferring what are the goals as an external observer of the system, which is what we do when we try to assess the intelligence of a young child or a dog. We may not have its goals explicitly represented. But yeah, I think, ultimately, you have to assume some distribution over goals and environments to, to assess intelligence. And we, we do that when doing IQ testing as, 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 as well. Yeah, well, yeah, so given the formalism in the paper, my hypothesis, which I did not prove yet, unfortunately, but even if I had, I couldn't have packed it into a six-page conference paper, but this 
my hypothesis is that to get a high level of intelligence in this sense, you would need to have a, a functor between the mind's graph and, and, and the world's graph. In other words, if, if the state transition graph in your mind does not somehow smoothly map into the state transition graph of the world, then you're going to be stupid because you're not, you're not accurately modeling what, what happens in the world. And I think if, if you could make a theory like this work really well, and I do have a proof of this sketched out, but I didn't put in all the details and there's no room in the paper anyway, but if, if you can make a theory like this really work, to me, this is, it's an interesting step. And the, the practical questions you'd like to be able to answer with something like this are, say, how... Here's one, one question. How, how important are fluids? Right? I mean, a, a virtual world has no fluids, powders. There's no peanut butter, right? I mean, so how important is that to human-like intelligence? Can, can we get away with a virtual world with no peanut butter and, and no blood and still have human-like intelligence? I mean, the, we, we explore these questions by trial and error, right? You would like to have a real theory of how does the world relate to the mind. And in practice, I think these theories are going to develop gradually together with the, the experimental implementation. I, I don't think we should stop work on building AGI systems and just sit there for 10 years and calculate the mathematical theory of, of intelligence. But nor do I think we should ignore the theory until we have a thinking machine and then ask it what the right theory is. I mean, we want to be working on the theory together with the implementation so they can, they can advance together, as has paid off in, in many other areas of science. All right, now we have approximately zero minutes for questions. But I, I, your talk is in, in 10 minutes, for that correct? I know, I know, I got so busy with the All right. <laughs> yeah, I guess we can do five minutes yes. of questions and then walk down to see his talk. I'm not assuming a discretized world. I think that the probabilistic state transition graph is an approximate model of the world. So if you have a continuous world, you, you can still approximately model it as a set of discrete states, which, of course, all of actual physics is based on discrete observations. I mean, the, the total scientific data ever collected is one finite set of bits from discrete points in time. So, yes, but the control system of the agent could work with it. Well, that, that's a sort of theological hypothesis because we've never observed a continuous value. It is, but it depends on how general you would like to be. Um, I don't see a need to be more general than assuming discrete values because all scientific data ever gathered is a set of discrete values. So the, the theology question of whether the world is ultimately Aleph 1 or Aleph infinity instead of discrete... I think we don't need to solve it in order to, to model AGI right. systems. I don't know what the real world is. Uh, all I know is what is the data that I have. The real world is, is this complicated thing. Re read The Twilight of the Idols by Friedrich Nietzsche. He, he explains this. Yeah. I, I think that what I've attempted to do is to relate knowledge with intelligence. So the hypothesis is that to be intelligent, your knowledge network has to somewhat represent the actual dynamics of the world around you. And if, if your knowledge network does not implicitly or explicitly represent what happens in the world then you're going to be stupid. That, that, that's the essence of this hypothesis. I mean, if you strip away all the math, all, all, all it says is that to be smart, your mind has to have some model of what happens in the world, which is, is trivially obvious when you pose it that way. But yet, getting it formulated precisely in, in a way that makes sense without making too many hard commitments about what the, the AI system is like, it, it's not that easy to, to formalize.
I have a question. You said the beauty awards do not have fluids, but the, the Benjamin Johnston's approach, they has fluids, hasn't he? Oh, some some virtual worlds have fluids, but they're pretty bad. I mean, they don't they don't like use the the Navier Stokes equation to get like okay. turbulent fluid dynamics and, and so forth. I mean, they, they don't have the richness of fluids that you have when you're a kid. I mean, when you think about what little kids do, they revel in playing with sand and peanut butter and, and mud and, and crap and the, every all sorts of different kinds of substances, right? And I wonder how much that contributes to the development of our, our flexibility of intelligence. So ultimately, I think a kind of rigid body, Newtonian blocks world is too limited. It's not going to be good enough. But it's you could try to make a video game engine that had a real model of naive physics, or you can use a robot that engages with the actual world. Although I'd have to say, if you take a current now robot and let it play with too much peanut butter, it may stop working well. Also, so the, in theory, robotics technology can let an AI engage with the physical world. In practice, current robots are also severely limited, just as, as current the virtual worlds. Oh, to get back to the analogy point I was making, so what, what, I, what I had been thinking pertinent to his talk was that if you model the source and target domain, like ocean and desert, as categories, so you, you looked at the you looked at the relations between the things in the ocean and desert, maybe you could say a good analogy is a mapping from one domain to another, which is a morphism in, in the category theory sense. And I talk about that, I talk about that a bit in the paper. Like if, if you had a bunch of episodes regarding cats in your memory, a bunch of episodes regarding tigers in your memory, and you wanted to take some knowledge about tigers and transfer it into knowledge about cats, I mean, that, that becomes what you call a natural transformation in, in category theory. So, in this sense, the notions of, of a morphism between categories provides more restriction on what is a good analogy that, than you would get in the theory he, he posited, which is, which is more open-ended and kind of said any, any mapping is an analogy. Another idea is that any approximate functor constitutes an, an analogy which restricts things a, a bit. Yeah, I, I think we have to One more, right? Well, I think that sudden breakthroughs are like phase transitions, which you can observe in a, in a bunch of water boiling in, in a shallow dish. So in any complex network of nonlinear connected elements with the right parameter values and initial conditions, I mean, it, that can demonstrate a phase transition, right? A, a sudden breakthrough from one, one state to another. So, I, yeah, I, I don't see any reason why that can't happen in an AI system like this. If you, if you think about the, the sort of reflectively conscious, verbally aware part of the mind, either in OpenCog or in you or any of us, it's a very small part of the mind. So if you have some nonlinear dynamics going on in the whole big distributed unconscious mind network, and that nonlinear dynamics leads to some phase transition, that may appear to the small, conscious, deliberative part of the mind, like, oh, wow, this idea appeared out of nowhere. But it actually appeared out of the nonlinear dynamics of all the elements going on in the un un unconscious mind. So, yeah, I, I see no reason why, why that can't happen. But we, we, we shall see, though. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation.